So we're going to talk today about uh, minimally invasive surgery, the foot and ankle, everything from Achilles to bunions. Uh, here's a little bit about my background. I did my med school training at University of Florida, go Gators. Uh, then I did uh, residency um, at Georgia Baptist and then my foot and ankle fellowship in mainly at Union with two Hopkins trained guys. Um, and I've been now at Southeast Orthopedic Specialists uh, for six and a half years as their, one of their foot and ankle uh, surgeons. So a little bit about basic anatomy first. Uh, there's 26 bones, 33 joints in the foot, 19 muscles, 107 ligaments, and four major neurologic uh, structures. Uh, frequently the foot anatomy is divided into the forefoot, which is the toes, and the metatarsals, which is that front part of the foot you see there, like from the letter B on. And then between A and B, you have the midfoot, which is the tarsal bones. And then be proximal to A, you have the hindfoot, which is the, basically your heel bone, the calcaneus, and the talus. Um, so we're going to talk about minimally invasive surgery. And basically what we're doing is basically using smaller incisions to accomplish the same things we do with the open or larger incisions. And our goals are to decrease pain, decrease deformity, and improve uh, function. So a little bit about minimally invasive surgery. It's not anything that's brand new. It's been around for over 30 years. And we'll go over a little bit of the, of the progression, but it, it started in the 1980s, as you can see with Isham, then progressed. Uh, the Europeans are really the ones that advanced it. And basically the first generation techniques by Isham in the 80s and 90s, um, the problem with those is that there was no fixation. Um, so they got sort of a bad name. Uh, the second generation techniques by Bosch and Siri and others in, in uh, Italy uh, were better, but they still lacked stable internal fixation. Um, and it was these two guys, Re David Redfern and um, uh, uh, Dr. Bernois, uh, who actually trained me, who applied a lot of the same principles we use in trauma um, and, uh, and fixation techniques that we use in trauma, such as screws and whatnot, to these um, osteotomies uh, that we do minimally invasively, which you'll see today. Um, so just to give you guys an idea of the penetration of um, minimally invasive surgery in the United States, um, in 2014, I co-chaired um, an advanced arthroscopy course in Baltimore, and there was really no MIS uh, uh, or minimally invasive surgery. And then you can see as the years progressed, 2015, there was half a day of MIS. And then by 2018, there was already two days of MIS and one day of arthroscopy. So really progressed quite uh, amazingly. And I had the pleasure of training with a lot of these Europeans who taught me a lot of what I know now. And then they invited me to go to uh, England where I actually uh, got to see them do it live before I actually did it on any patients. So what did I do in my preliminary experience? So I've been doing this for, uh, it, in, if you include the training for five years, but really um, on actual patients for three and a half years. And uh, so initially I wanted to start easy. So here's a 75 year old patient with crowding of the toes, um, basically with just soft tissue release and uh, a small simple osteotomy, as you see there in the toe, we can realign it uh, uh, pretty well. Um, here's another example of where it's really advanced uh, in hallux rigidus, which is basically arthritis of the big toe. People usually get spurring and limited motion and have um, uh, pain uh, in, the, in that joint. So traditionally you can see this big open incision we, we used to have to do, and now we can accomplish the same thing through these minimally invasive uh, techniques as you see here. And here's a, a video of what we would do. We make a small half centimeter incision, which is like a, the size of a pencil eraser. Um, then we bring in the burr and we can basically shave down that spur that one might have uh, in the great toe. Um, and even in the midfoot area, um, we can also, you can see these prominent spurs here. And we used to have to make big incisions, but now using the same techniques uh, with small um, incisions, uh, we can accomplish the same thing. And if you look at uh, the results, I think you can see 
how you can barely uh, uh, see these uh, incisions and uh, we can take down these big spurs without a problem. Here's the before on the left, the after on the right. Um, how about flat foot? Well, flat foot, um, you know, people with flat foot that their foot starts to sag or uh, what we call go into valgus. Uh, multiple causes, including tendon insufficiency or rupture, arthritis, and uh, ligament uh, issues. And, and, you know, minimally invasive surgery has really been a game changer when it comes to this, because as you can see here, we used to do this bigger incision to, to actually realign the foot. And now we can, through this small incision, we can actually do this. And the indications for really are lower threshold because now we don't have to worry about any soft tissue complications. We can accommodate um, um, other incisions and not have to worry about multiple incisions, multiple large incisions, I should say, when we're doing um, uh, this surgery. And you can see the process here. We, we have this motorized burr that we use to actually cut the heel bone. And you see the, um, we make just a straight cut, as you can see here, then we can shift it over. And here's on the left, the traditional approach. And then on the right, what we can do now with this minimally invasive approach and we use these screws that are headless screws as opposed to the ones we used to use and often had to take out because they had they were headed. Um, and the data is pretty good on this. Here's a study out of tw in, uh, from the Foot and Ankle Journal in 2019, 122 patients showing less wound problems, less uh, uh, incidence of nerve injury and less recurrence or, or revision. Um, Moving on to ankle arthritis, common problem in my practice. Um, you know, the, the options before were basically ankle fusion or replacements, which have come a long way. Uh, the implant that you see there is, is the one I started with, which, which is probably about 21 years ago. Uh, so um, uh, more recent advances have uh, allowed us to actually use a CAT scan or a CT to base the implants off of this. So if you look on your picture on, on the right side, you can see that those guides are made, tailor-made to your ankle and um, uh, basically has revolutionized what we do. Uh, here's someone with severe ankle arthritis. And as you can see, um, this is what we do to replace it. And what you'll notice is that, you know, we can still do the osteotomy that I just talked about even in the situation of an ankle replacement, if we need to correct more uh, deformity. And th the reason this is so groundbreaking is because, you know, when you're doing a total ankle, you're making a relatively large incision. So making another large incision would be kind of a big deal. But with MIS, we can do the smaller incision that you see there and accomplish the same thing. So let's move on to what uh, a lot of people came here for, which is the the, the minimally invasive bunion correction. And let's talk a little bit about bunions. You know, you could do conservative treatment with splints and shoe wear modifications, but if they stay symptomatic, there's only two ways to treat the bunion and you can change the shape of the shoe or change the shape of the foot. So it, now we have a minimally invasive way of doing it. Traditionally, here are the big incisions we did before, whereas now you can see with minimally invasive surgery, they're almost uh, imperceptible. So here's kind of the, 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 the approach, again, through a half centimeter incision, size of a, of a pencil eraser, and then we can make the cut with the burr and basically um, through the metatarsal bone. Um, this then you'll see in a second gets shifted, um, and then we're able to put in uh, screws through very small incisions and accomplish uh, what we need to do. Uh, so this, this is part of what makes this surgery less painful and, um, um, and, and causes less swelling after surgery. So basically just a stepwise approach, we, we draw out where we're, where we're gonna operate, uh, basically make that half centimeter incision. Here's an actual picture of the burr we actually use. Uh, and this is an actual intraoperative picture. Um, basically, we cut the bone, as you can see here. Um, and then uh, basically, here's a diagrammatic picture of how that burr actually works to basically cut the bone. And the nice thing about this is there's an irrigation device, which 
makes it so that this is constantly irrigated so that you don't burn the bone or the tissues. And this is what you can expect as a patient. You know, preoperatively, you have uh, moderate uh, bunion deformity. And you can see at two weeks, still looks like patients had surgery. And then at four weeks, you're, you're almost looking like um, there, there's no wounds there. So it's really changed um, uh, this quite a bit. Here's a 50-year-old with moderate bunion deformity. And then again, a correction. And that picture on the right is basically about four weeks again. Uh, what you can expect. Here's a 60-year-old with severe bunion deformity and what we call crossover toe deformity. And this is sort of a, a, a variant of claw toes uh, where the toes are going uh, all the way into the, into the inside and crossing over with, with the bunion. And basically, you can see here's three months out uh, with bunion correction and correction of those claw toes. Um, and um, I think that looks pretty good compared to where we started with. So um, here's a, a testimonial of one of my patients six weeks post, um, and I hope you guys can hear this. Um, but um, anyway, I can't hear it very well, but hopefully this is uh, uh, projecting okay. Okay. So she's six weeks post-op on the right from MIS versus 10-year follow-up left open, okay? And, um, and then this is Andrea, which I know well because she gave me permission uh, to... Basically, I'll see that. Um, okay, we're back on. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so Andrea had a really good result, as you can see. And um, uh, here's another 65-year-old uh, with, um, again, a bunion deformity and deviation of the second and third toes, which is more mild in nature. So you don't have to do the full um, double osteotomy every time, but you can actually do, um, as you see here, just the Aiken part of the osteotomy. Uh, and uh, correct the toes, again, through small incisions, though, and really uh, change the way people live um, uh, with a significant decrease in their, in their pain. Here's a rheumatoid forefoot. Um, this is before the reconstruction. This is how we used to do it uh, with relatively bigger incisions. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I used to think I made relatively small incisions, but now with MIS claw toe correction, you can see the small incisions that are made to accomplish really the same uh, thing. And here's another patient of mine um, who had severe metatarsalgia on, the, uh, on that left side. Um, and I'll, I'll ask my, uh, my staff if you guys can hear this. I'm sorry, we're having problems with our audio. Uh, but uh, basically, the, the gist of this is that, you know, she had the metatarsalgia with the claw toes on the left side, and then on the right side, you know, you could see how there's the callus is basically gone, and this really changed her, her life quite a bit, and I, this is a patient I still see, and she's doing great. Uh, so more advanced techniques. So basically, uh, diabetics uh, get neuropathy, which is uh, basically they lose um, their ability to feel normally. 
And this presents significantly increased risk for, for wound complications. As you can see, they developed this rocker bottom deformity that you see there. It makes it difficult for them uh, to uh, walk and function. Traditionally, we did this open approach um, where we had to, in order to recreate the arch. But now we can do it through uh, minimally invasive approaches. And you can see here the small incisions and how the arch has been uh, restored. Here's a 55-year-old patient of mine with diabetes and neuropathy, progressive collapse of the arch. Um, and you can see it's almost dislocated. And uh, through these approaches, we can actually restore the arch, as you can see there, and really uh, give them quite good function. And you can see here how uh, the incisions we make are relatively small compared to what we used to make. Let's talk a little bit about arthroscopy. Um, basically, um, you know, arthroscopy is minimally invasive because you're using a small camera to look in a joint. That's what arthroscopy is versus the minimally invasive surgery. Um, and one of the things we can treat with this is ankle instability. And as we know, this is very common in 40% of athletic injuries. Usually patients turn their ankle and have an inversion event. About 20% of these patients will fail conservative treatment and need uh, surgery. So basically um, we grade them by mild, moderate or severe. Um, and initial treatment is always conservative with a brace or a boot um, and functional uh, recovery with exercise. Um, but when uh, they fail this, then they may need lateral ligament repair or reconstruction. And before we used to basically have to make holes through bones and make this big open approach. Uh, whereas now we can do it through the arthroscope, putting our anchors in and passing these uh, sutures that are, that are tied to the anchor through the lateral ligament uh, complex. And then we can basically tighten up these lateral ligaments through this arthroscopic uh, approach. And you can see the incisions, you know, three months out are barely uh, uh, seen. So how about Achilles tendonitis? Another very common problem, inflammation of the Achilles tendon uh, occurs in all age groups, you know, athletes uh, to, um, you know, uh, weekend warriors. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, this can cause, the inflammation can lead to degeneration and even partial tearing uh, of the tendon. One of the treatments we can do conservatively is platelet-rich plasma, which is we draw blood from you and we get the growth factors and inject them in the tendon. And this is about 50 to 70% effective, similar to conservative, to, to non-surgical treatment. However, when all of this uh, fails, then we look for surgical options. Here's a patient of mine, 62 year old female, one year history of heel pain and failed conservative treatment. This patient had a history of diabetes, obviously somebody that we wanna be careful with any kind of incisions we make because they can lead uh, to complications and wound care problems. So with minimally invasive surgery, we're able to basically um, get rid of that spur and repair the tendon all through minimally invasive approaches. This is the traditional approach. And you can see this big incision that we used to make is probably not something we'd like to do now. Uh, instead, we, you can see the healing immediate post-op in three weeks after an Achilles uh, tendon uh, repair and, 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 and removal of that bump in the back of the heel. So um, in conclusion, why MIS? Well, as we've been talking about, there's minimal soft tissue dissection, there's less stiffness afterwards, and it does minimize the complications and improves the cosmesis. Uh, so it's really been quite a, a game changer. Thank you. And now we'll, we'll take some questions. Okay, so uh, in answer to your question, as we discussed for hallux rigidus, um, the, um, the MIS is ideal for hallux rigidus when basically it's the bump that's bothering you, we can shave that down. Um, and um, if that doesn't uh, uh, work, there are other procedures that we can do through, through a, a smaller but open approach um, in order to either um, 
uh, fuse the joint or uh, perform what's called an interposition arthroplasty, which I won't get it bogged down too much into it, but, but suffice it to say that there is several alternatives. Okay, so that's a common question. And uh, my, my standard answer is that I normally would discourage you from doing both feet because, you know, as the victim says, you don't have a, a leg to stand on um, uh, after surgery. And, and the reality of it is, is that it's, it's, it's a lot on the patient. And, um, and I, I, I usually encourage people to do one foot at a time. And, you know, depending on the surgery that we're doing, you could, you, you don't really have to wait, but maybe, um, six to eight weeks, um, depending on the surgery though. I mean, if it's a bigger surgery, depends on all we're doing, uh, you may have to wait the three months. So <clears throat> basically, um, if you're having no pain currently, I would discourage you from doing any surgery because um, I think that, um, uh, you know, that's why we try non-surgical treatment to start is if non-surgical treatment works, then surgery is not indicated unless there's severe deformity. So in, in answer to that is, is if there's progressive collapse and that causes um, any kind of wound problems, then that would be another indication aside from pain to proceed with, with the surgery. So yes, um, actually uh, some of the pictures I showed, I know were adults, but some similar procedures are done um, in, in children. Um, it depends on a lot on the age of the, of the child um, and the degree of deformity on, on what procedures we do. But, um, but, you know, if the growth plates are still open, then the calcaneal osteotomy I showed would not be done. Um, uh, or it could be done, but, but we, we couldn't use the screws that we use because you don't want to go through the growth plate with the screws. Um, I, I don't know that high impact exercise is bad when you have bunions. Um, it's bad if you just had surgery for bunions, um, uh, and it could aggravate a bunion. Uh, but I don't, I don't know that it's necessarily, uh, bad. You know, if you're not having pain in your bunion, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that the high impact, um, uh, is going to really aggravate the bunion, if you will. It's more related to shoe wear and, um, and to some degree, uh, uh, genetics, you know, familial tendency for the bunions. Um, so yes, so um, depending on, you know, um, you know, your, your age range, you know, um, if, if, um, you know, if you, or, or if you want to avoid surgery is, is how I would put it. Um, then yeah, there's, there's definite, uh, active ankle braces that can be used, uh, for people with ankle instability. Um, I think that, um, you know, uh, if you're going to use them long-term, then you might want to get a custom brace, um, uh, to address that problem. Not always. So if the fibula bone is broken and what we call displaced, then surgery is most likely indicated. Um, if it's non-displaced or it hasn't shifted, and if the ankle, uh, what we call the ankle mortis hasn't shifted, then most of the time surgery is not indicated. 